Chapter 7, so I'm going to get started here. My name is Tom Holman. I'm with the Bloomington Housing Authority. I uh, manage a home improvement loan program. Uh, it seems like most of the people I deal with are interested in replacing their windows. So we thought that it would be interesting to put together a presentation uh, so people can learn a little bit more, either to do it themselves or to know what to talk to the contractors about. Um, the city does not endorse or promote any particular business or product, so Marvin was gracious enough to volunteer to make this presentation tonight, but we're not pushing them. Um, Ken Modine is an architectural representative for Marvin Windows, and he is going to make the presentation tonight. And I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him introduce himself. I'm going to duck out here because we uh, ran out of the uh, PowerPoint guides, and if someone doesn't have one, I'll make a couple more copies and put them on the table over front here. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. As Tom said, my name is Ken Modine. I work for Marvin Windows and Doors, and I'm an architectural representative for Marvin Windows and Doors, which means my job basically is to, is to track down commercial projects that architects are working on where they would like to use some of our window or door products or all of our window and door products in them. And then I assist the architects to um, help to design our products into their buildings. Uh, which does include doing uh, drawings for architects, uh, going to the job site uh, on maybe a historic renovation, something like that, and actually working with the architect, possibly a contractor if they're involved, to ensure that, that the, the products, everything goes right, the products are the right size, everything fits, the installation is uh, understood by everyone in the, in the um, in the project, how that's supposed to be done, and so that it gets done right. What we're talking about here tonight is window installation fundamentals. What I'm going to show you is not necessarily the only way to do these things, but it is the way that we typically recommend doing it, and we might, we might recommend different ways for different types of buildings or different types of applications but I'm going to give you the general fundamentals with the idea that if you're thinking of replacing your windows and doors in your home, um, maybe you would get a good understanding of some of the steps that a contractor that you might be interviewing uh, should be talking about. And if they're not, maybe you need to take those questions a little further and find out why they're not talking about these particular steps or maybe interview other contractors who may talk about uh, some of the steps that we're going to talk about. Because it's about water management. Uh, the installation fundamentals that I'm going to show you today are about managing the water that is going to get into your building and into the rough openings and parts of your building that are behind your siding, behind your stucco, um, behind your bricks, you know, the industry tells us that three to five percent of all of water that your home comes in contact with gets by the exterior surface, gets through the bricks, through the, uh, through the mortar area of the bricks. It gets behind the vinyl siding, it gets behind the stucco. Whatever your finished product is, three to five percent of water gets behind there and then we need to begin to manage it to make sure that it stays outside of your wall system. You think three to five percent, that's, that's not too bad when you're talking about a hundred percent and we're talking about three to five that gets behind there. But every house in Minnesota for sure comes in contact with thousands of gallons of water a year with wind driven rain, snow, ice, that sort of thing. And it's the wind-driven rain that we're really concerned with because that's pressurized water that makes its way through every crevice and crack and gets behind there. So that's what we want to talk about today is how to be sure that we can manage that water that is going to get behind the finished surface of your home. In the best possible installations anyone can do, three to five percent of water 
moisture will get behind the finish of your home. This happens to be a, an AIA approved course. So uh, the um, American Institute of Architects approved this course and many others that we have and that we've written. Uh, and it is actually given to architects uh, as well so that they can uh, understand the water management, uh, in this case, in residential homes. Anyone in here an architect tonight? If you were, you would actually get architectural credits for, uh, for attending this seminar. What we want to do tonight is to discuss the installation preparations for wood windows, uh, aluminum clad windows and doors, and structural installations if we need those as well. We want to explain how to flash the installation of the windows and doors and list some of the final installation procedures to facilitate a successful installation. Uh, the course pretty much pertains to aluminum clad windows. When we talk about aluminum clad windows, we're talking about an aluminum exterior and a wood interior window in a wood frame construction building. That's what this course is about. Or all wood windows, no aluminum exterior, for instance, in a wood frame construction, but also fiberglass windows in a wood, uh, wood frame construction building. And it's also important to note that these are fundamentals. Uh, they're suggested ways to do things. Every building is different. Every community is different. Uh, even with the respect of climate, for instance, when we go to Duluth, Duluth calls themselves a microclimate, and they are. They've got the large hill behind them. Now they come down to the lake. And when you're down in Duluth, the weather in Duluth many times is totally different than the weather up on Miller Hill. I'm sure a lot of you folks know that. So climate makes a lot of difference if you're in a very high elevation in Minnesota somewhere or a low elevation. There might be some different concerns on what materials and what processes might be used. Your local building inspectors and your local contractors typically know some of those differences and may want to implement them over some of what we're talking about here. But this will give you the basic information uh, that you should be looking for. When we're talking about rough openings, that is this opening that you see in your wall. <coughs> Windows should be typically one inch narrower than the opening in your wall and one half inch shorter than the opening in your wall. If you're watching an installation happen and the windows are being set into place and they're being wedged into place, they're tight, um, that is not correct. Windows should be, they should have a half inch void to, to each side to the rough opening and a half inch void to the top. Yes, sir. Well, uh, what is the cause of the difference? Half inch to one inch. Oh, the half inch yeah, to. Why, yeah, why is there a difference? How because the window itself sets directly on the sill and would not take a half inch void under it. So it simply takes a half inch void above the top of it, between the top and the rough opening. But each side takes a half inch void. So that's our one inch, and the top is our half inch. We don't want a void on the underside of the sill. We want that to go ahead and set right on the opening. That's the difference. That's why we have a one inch in width and a half inch difference in height. What a masonry opening is, a masonry opening, although it's, the word is masonry and it's kind of implying brick or stucco, it simply is the finished materials opening on the exterior of your home. In other words, if you measured from siding to siding across the window, or brick to brick, or stucco to stucco, whatever that finished material is, that's called the masonry opening. The masonry opening, that finished material, should not butt right up to your window. There should always be about a quarter inch difference from that finished material on your home to where the edge of that window uh, is. And that would, be a, that would be an opening that would be caulked, 
and it allows for some expansion and contraction of the window. It allows for some expansion, contraction, and movement of that finished material. If the finished material is butted right against the side of the window and you get swelling or expansion and contraction, we're now pushing against the window frame. And we're going to cause some buckling maybe in your finished material, particularly if it's something like vinyl siding, you'll start to see some buckling, aluminum siding, that sort of thing. But if it's brick or stucco, that's not going to do the buckling. The window will do the buckling at that point. So we want to keep a space between there, and typically that's going to be a quarter of an inch all the way around. Question on that. Yeah. So you mentioned caulking. Is this a place where you can use some of that expand spray and expandable foam? Well, it wouldn't be on the outside here. The, the outside where the, uh, where the finished material meets the window, that would be a true caulking material, oh, the best you can get. Oh, okay, moisture barrier. Okay. Yeah, something that's going to last 50 years, something that's going to be have a lot of elasticity for those 50 years and, and, and allow some cushion there. The spray foam that we're talking about, that will go between that void between the window and the roof opening. That's an insulation material. The caulking is a sealing material. Um, now, there are a couple of different type of pans, and when, we, when I talk about a pan, we're going to talk about at the bottom of this rough opening where the window's going to go, we want to ensure that we're shedding water to the outside. Nothing soaks into the wall down here through this bottom. That's called a panning system. Whether it's on a window and a door, it's the pan that we're going to create before we ever put the window in there to make sure that we route all the water to the outside. <coughs> On that masonry opening that we talked about, can you see okay? All right. On that masonry opening that we talked about, where we have brick, we want brick veneer on a home, we want to make sure that we have about a half inch distance between the bottom of the windowsill and the top of that brick ledge. Um, particularly on new construction, a new home, we want a, at least a good half inch there. On a wood frame home with a brick veneer, and if it's brand new, the wood itself has a, 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 the home itself has a fairly high moisture content. As the home dries out, as wood dries out, it begins to shrink, right? When it takes on water, it swells. When it relieves water and dries out, it shrinks. Well, the wood studs in a wall also will shrink in length. The window will follow it. And if we only leave ourselves a quarter of an inch or so, that windowsill at the end of a couple years in new construction home may be setting right on that brick ledge. If it sets right on that brick ledge and it shrinks any more, then the wall doesn't tip in, right? Because now the brick ledge is pushing up on the window. What happens is the brick ledge will begin to push the sill of the window up. And then your windows are going to bind when you have a casement window that cranks in and out it's going to bind where that sill is being pushed up. Where we have brick veneer, we want to make sure we have a good gap. If it's two-story, this gap would probably go more to a 5 8 maybe even a 3 quarter, because we're going to have more shrinkage as we add stories to that building. Same thing holds true if instead of using brick, you're using like a rock? Anything solid like that. Anything solid that's not going to give at all. Vinyl siding, not such a big deal. It's going to give. The window's tougher than that siding is. It's not tougher than the rock, and it's not tougher than bricks. It's not tougher than stucco either, but um, you'd, you'd still want to do the same, same on the, the stucco as well. Uh, let's go to our next slide here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about installing this window. But before I do that, I want to talk about some of these materials that you see around here, the wraps. A house wrap 
is a material that is uh, wrapped on the outside of your home to manage the water that's going to get behind the finished materials on your home. There are different types of wraps, different brands. I have two different types here. Uh, these two types are both made of Tyvek. This is home wrap that I'm going to pass around. And it's a flat type of a product. The reason you, the, the material that you would use home wrap on would be a type of finished material that is not direct you know, in direct hard contact with the with your exterior sheathing, okay? So a vinyl siding, aluminum siding, a steel siding, those things, those types of materials that have, I'm going to set this down for a sec so I can show you what we're talking about. Those types of materials that if this is your outside sheathing, that's this surface. The siding materials are kind of hollow. You know what I mean? This is not solid. This is a void back in here. This is hollow. Okay? The, the, the home wrap that we see there is flat and smooth, and it, it allows the migration of the water behind it. What I have on this particular uh, mock-up wall is what's called drain wrap. Drain wrap is a bit different than house wrap in that you can see that it's crinkly and it has sort of a corrugated sort of effect to it. What we want to use the drain wrap for is materials that are going to come up and press tight to the building. Um, some type of maybe a wood siding. Um, uh, cedar siding, that sort of thing, uh, plywood type of sidings. And what, what the drain wrap's going to do then is as you put the materials tight up against the sheathing, it's, it's, this corrugated effect is still going to allow a little bit of migration room behind those solid materials so the water can run down the wall. And what water are we talking about? We're talking about the water that's going to get behind the siding. Okay, we want to let it run down the wall, we want to let it run out the bottom. There are other types of wraps out there, other companies make wraps as well, um, but uh, typically they're one of these two different types and some of them are even more elaborate type of drain systems uh, that you will see. What is that adhered to the, the, the side? Can we glue that on? No, it is... Um, it is stretched and wrapped around the building, and this is very important. Wrap is wrapped, stretched and wrapped around the building, and the correct way to install a building wrap is with these button nails. These button nails are the approved fasteners from most of these wrap systems. They would go where you would find a stud here in the wall, they would be nailed into that. Or if it's a solid sheathing like, a, like an OSB or a plywood or something, they can, they can nail them wherever they like, but typically they're going to nail them in studs. These buttons will seal off the hole that they're going to make with the nail. I'm going to pass that around if you just pass that one around. As opposed to... <coughs> You know what one of these are? These are a staple hammer. Not too long ago when folks put on Tyvek, they just start banging on the house with a staple hammer all over the place, keeping it in place there. Well, every time you do that, you perforate the house wrap. And when you perforate the house wrap, you allow an area for moisture or moisture vapor to get through that particular wrap at that certain point. So if folks are wrapping your home and they're banging on your home with a stapler, just know that that is not the approved way to uh, apply this stuff on your home. And if most wrap companies will come out, 
because you've had some leakage and now you want the wrap company to stand behind their product and they begin to take siding off and the house is peppered with a uh, staple hammer, uh, they'll say that's, that's why you have issues. Okay. So that was very important to talk about how that's applied to the home. What we want to do is we want to um, cut this house wrap at the window opening and do the correct type of uh, procedure on it so that we continue the water migration down this house wrap. If we take a look at the drawing that we have up there and it's on your sheet, you can see there's a particular way we want to do that. <coughs> when we're talking about windows, we want to make our cut like this. We want to cut it straight. Can you, you can see the opening behind there, right? We want to cut it straight across at the head of this opening. And we want to make an upside down Y here. We want to come down the center of this particular opening. And we want to move, actually we want to move out here a couple of inches up and out this way a couple of inches up. We, we cut that over a little bit. And you'll see why we're doing all these steps as we move along. They, they all make sense. The first thing we want to do is go ahead and fold our house wrap across the bottom of our rough opening. Now, this is a kind of a foam mock-up of a wall, so I can't really use uh, nails or anything. So I'm just going to go ahead and tape everything off. But we want to fold the bottom down. Now we have to decide at this point, well, we've decided already a long time ago what we're going to use for a pan system. But I want to show you the different types of pan system. And this is the point at how we do some things differently. There are several types of pan systems. And one is called a rigid pan system. That's going to be a water management pan for a window opening or a door opening that's rigid. It's usually made of a composite. It's usually got like two ends to it with the corners that come up. And this type of pan system would be installed like this right now and then the wrap would go over the top of it so that any water migration in here is lapped over the top of our pan would come down the bottom and make its way to the outside. A pan system, a rigid pan system like this would be caulked here on the back or basically caulked down the bottom and up the sides of the wrap and then it would be put into place, nailed into place. The wrap goes across the top of it like that. So any side migration is going to come right down over the top of it and out the outside of it. You might have a one-piece metal pan system that would go in here made for each opening. That would go in basically the same way. It wouldn't be constructed in the opening on like with two pieces. It'd be one large piece to begin with. But it would go in there the same way. That's the only type of system where, you're gonna, where we're going to talk about caulking anywhere around the bottom, uh, the bottom of a sill of a rough opening. Typically, we're going to tell you to stay away from caulking anywhere down in here because these are weep points. We want the water to weep out here. We don't want to seal it up. Um, but the pan, 
because we're going to caulk it behind the pan, all of the weeping is done on top of the pan. Okay. So that's a rigid pan system. <coughs> the top of the window, we want to go ahead and cut a couple of cuts and we want to fold it out of the way. Like so. Again, if someone is folding these sides and tops out of the way and to hold it in place, they're putting a few staples into place to keep it held out of the way. You can do that. You have to remember when you pull it back and put things back together, you have to tape up it, every one of those little staple holes that go in there. Okay? It's just not a good way to do it. It's better just to tape it off, get it out of the way with tape, until you're ready to bring it back around again. That's that rigid pan system we're talking about that, that I just described a little bit. Same thing. Where you brought that side down to meet the rigid pan, you would tape this cut. You would bring this back around and you would tape that cut back off. You would also tape across the top of that rigid pan where it meets. There's a special tape that you use? Yeah, you want to use the tape that's recommended by the wrap system you're using. Uh, this tape, this is uh, the seam tape, so this is used to tape anywhere there's a seam or a cut, nail hole, something, that, something that's a perforation, you would tape it off. And, and also any, any joints or laps, everything gets taped up and sealed completely tight on that house. That's the tape you use whatever's recommended by the type of wrap that you're using on your home. Right here we're talking about building paper. If we weren't using a house wrap and we were just using a building paper, which is a felt, typically called tar paper or felt, <coughs> you can do that. Um, it's, it's used here and there some places, but um, I think typically most anyone you're going to see building today is going to be using a house wrap. Building paper might be used where um, certain masonry products might be used, uh, brick, uh, maybe some stucco, things like that, because there are some applications where you use double, double felt, that sort of thing, to make sure that there's no contact between the backside of that masonry and any of your, any of your wood in your structure. That's usually where any sort of felt or building paper would be used today, but, um, but um, I, think, I think typically you're going to find most all contractors are using house wrap today. Um, I want to, uh, and this again is talking about some more building paper. I don't think it's something that, um, that you will find uh, anyone using except for in certain masonry applications. This is that rigid, like a, like a galvanized steel or an aluminum sill pan system. It's a one-piece system. It's fastened and soldered together, fits right in there as one piece. But the, but the system I want to talk to about today is creating a sloped rough opening sill, and that is what we recommend for window installations, is to use a sloped rough opening sill. If it's new construction, your contractor can slope the framing. He can slope the framing somewhat when he builds the place. But I have an idea that you're all in here because of replacing windows in an existing home that's not going to have a slope sill. Then we recommend that you create a slope sill for your home. The easiest way to do that is with a piece of uh, what, eight inch cedar siding, I believe this is eight inch, which is going to be uh, wide enough for most any wall. 
and then you rip the 8 inch cedar siding to whatever your wall thickness is. You also use that same thing to cut some what we call contradicting shims. I'm going to pass these around so you can see what that material is like. So we took a piece of 8 inch cedar siding here. We ripped it down to the wall depth of our mock-up unit here. And we're going to apply that over the area where this wrap has been put over the sill. <clears throat> Okay, that gives us a sloped sill. If we were to look at this sideways, you can see now that we have a sloped sill on top of our rough opening. That sloped sill will let any moisture that comes in here migrate to the outside and not to the inside. The next thing we want to use is a sill flashing. There are, there are different types from different folks, different manufacturers. The one we're going to use here today is called Flex Wrap. And it is a one piece flashing system that is flexible. It allows itself to be bent around corners, things like that. It's a very sticky, particular, very sticky product. Now there's one thing I want to talk about, all of these flashing systems. Please read your instructions or go online and read instructions before you begin any window installation, uh, building wrap application completely read the installation instructions. There's important information in there. When it comes to flashing and windows and windows that use a vinyl nailing fin like this, like we see on this window here that we're going to use, the installation instructions will typically tell you that if you use an asphalt based product that it will um, void the warranty for flashing that particular vinyl fin. Okay? Over the years asphalt based products will degrade that vinyl on that fin. So that's why we want you to be sure you read all of those directions bef you know, through the process of making your decision on what materials you're going to use. Now this is a Tyvek product. All Tyvek products are butyl based and that's what we recommend if, uh, as a window manufacturer is a butyl based product for the adhesive. Even though it's black and black is what the asphalt based products are going to be, you need to read what those, uh, what those materials are. And this is a butyl based system even though it's black. What we're going to do is create an impervious skin on this uh, pan. And an impervious skin simply means that the moisture that gets on this pan will not soak through it. It has to run off. Okay. And we go up the sides like this. You want to go up the sides several inches, three, four inches, six, eight. The material is fairly expensive, so typically we 
The house wrap is going to wrap around the side so we don't go all the way up the side with it. Okay, the nice thing about this flex wrap type material is you simply, it just will go ahead and bend and form to anything. So we're going to tie it to the face of this building wrap. And we're going to bring our wrap on in. Now on the inside of this building, if it was new construction, this would be uh, open studs at this point. And we would be um, just securing it to the open studs. On a finished home, um, you'd have to terminate it you know, somewhere in here. And if you terminate it somewhere in here, you would tape all that off. You'd, you want to seal any place any seam, any edge of this stuff, you want it sealed and taped off. Now you can see that what we've created is a pan system that any moisture getting in this side or this side or coming through a window or coming into the opening around the uh, fins or wherever it might come is going to get into the opening. If it does get into the opening, it's got to run down. This is a shingle wrap type of overlap system so it's got to run down onto the pan and it now has to run out of the building. It's very important that that, that, that system be put that way. If you wrap the sides first and then you put the flashing on, well then we'd have, a, then we'd have an inverted seam here where water might be able to get behind the flashing. So always think about water, where it's going to run, how it's going to run. We want to seal, this is a seam. We want to be sure we seal that seam off. Like so. Most wrap companies want you to use their own products, their own tapes. Um, many of them have a warranty that says as long as all of our products and accessories are used and used correctly, uh, they'll, they'll, warrant the, they'll warrant the wrap on the house. So that's, that's, what's a, that's what a window or a door pan looks like. Yes? Um, this is actually the system that we recommend now. Um, we find that um, this flexible wrap uh, just does a better job of getting into every little crevice and sticking to every little part of the rough opening. This is what we recommend now typically. Now there might be the, the, metal, the metal pan that I talked about, that's, that's typically a commercial project. Uh, it will be specced into a commercial project maybe. Um, that rigid composite pan there, that's a residential project, product if you want to use that. But we find that this, this is a product that, that, uh, that we recommend and most contractors like this to work with this better as well. See it has no seams where that one has a seam. The rigid pan that we're going to put together in two halves has a seam right here in the middle and we're always, we're always a little leery of seams. Yes, sir? Do you buy that by the foot, or do you have to buy like a 25 foot roll? This here? Yeah. You buy it, you buy it by the rolls, but there are different rolls. But you, I don't think you can walk into anywhere and ask for 12 feet of it and they peel it off. Maybe. Um, seems to me a, um, uh, 
a smart uh, lumber company or whatever would have a roll and sell it by the foot or because it comes in fairly long rolls but then again they're not selling you a whole roll at that but point. How much so. is it per foot? Gosh, it's, it's expensive. Um, well, relative to what it does, it's not expensive, but it's, it's, it's dollars a foot, put it that way. Yes, sir? Um, if you're doing replacement windows and you're not going to change the siding of the house that doesn't have house rafters with vintage, so basically you'd be dealing just with the direct opening. Do you, do you do anything with the house wrap still, or do you just work with the, the flex wrap type stuff? Well, I'm going to tell you as a window manufacturer, this is the recommended installation is a house wrap covering all of the sheathing and then, and then an installation like you see here to remove a window to remove the brick mold and then you've got whatever two or three inches around that window and if that's the way, if that's the way you're going to do it, then my recommendation would be the whole opening being done in flex wrap. It's not the recommended way to do, to, I mean, the recommended thing would be take that finished material off and wrap the house and do it all at once. Be It'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. But in lieu of that, in lieu of that, I think, the, I think that, that the best alternative to that would be everything done in flex wrap. All right. It seems to me that Well, it's 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 probably another reason reason we recommend this is is that is rigid and every time you start building things out, you get that little. Against the rest of the raft, and you got that that's right. Obstacle there. It seems to me that that might be an issue. You know, over the last ten years, all sorts of different ways and systems have been used, and I think that this flex wrap system or this flexible flashing system, what, whoever it's being made by, um, I think has kind of won out over, over everyone else. So I, I think it's, it's the way to go. Does the adhesive quality on that stay forever and ever, regardless of the age of the house? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah, it, the, a lot of this stuff is pretty new stuff. It's 10 or 15 years old. It seems to be holding now. If we go out and pull out a window uh, for whatever reason, uh, maybe, maybe it was defective and we pull out a window, it seems to be holding 10 years or so now. I don't know about 50 years from now, but uh, Tyvek would be able to answer those things. You know, and, and I, the same vein as some of these others, where we have an older house, and well, if we can't do the whole job of replacing siding, we should decide, okay, Maybe uh, maybe this year we can do do windows or some of the windows or whatever. We start doing replacement. Uh, this flex wrap, you know, it looks like it works really well, but you know, it seems like leading into okay, we 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 we, ex we open it up and we expose to get that old window out of there, and we more than likely have building belt tar paper, yeah. you know, underneath our 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 siding, and then we start thinking about oh flex wrap, you know, and then. That's what I'm thinking is, okay, how long will that flex wrap, you know, stay glued to my old tar paper kind of thing, you know? Yeah, the, really the best way to do it, if it's at all possible and, you, and you're not going to replace your siding and you're not going to strip the house completely off and, and redo the whole exterior, the best way to do it is at least to get as wide a swath as you can around those old windows. If right now you have two inch brick mold, maybe you can sit, could consider taking that out, taking an extra couple inches, putting the windows in, and using <clears throat> maybe a window, either wood or clad, that's got a wider, a wider casing to it, so that you can get back to good materials and at least try and tie into good materials back there. If it's a uh, uh, tar paper or whatever it might be because it's going to be pretty ragged around the window area and I can't answer how good this sticks to to uh, felt. Yes sir. And potentially you're going to have some damage around various windows of the bleed pool 
of the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the easy qualities of that and those damage areas are zero. Yeah, if you've got punky wood, though, you should be replacing that anyway, you know, um, and, and get down to new stuff that things will grab onto and hang onto. Yes, sir. Somebody had said something with their straight guard adhesiveness. I last as long as your shingles do, because uh, that ice and storm shield is actually using the same adhesive as the uh, rat does. That butyl yeah. that you speak of. So it's oftentimes used on the shield this uh, the ice shield is used up mm -hmm. from your better line mm -hmm. it's up on your roof it lasts way over 20 years yeah you have to remember that it's not exposed to sunlight or anything like that it's 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 and and the sill pan itself has weight on it all the time it's got the window sitting on it so it even if even if the adhesion of it might might not might degrade it's it still has weight keeping it in place and it has nail fins keeping it in place so um, but anyway up till now we haven't heard or seen anything that tells us that the adhesive is is given up I'm going to move on here a bit because we slope the sill and because windows and doors need a flat surface to sit on they can't sit on a slope sill you know they can't have a void out here at the end if your window is sitting on here like this, it can't have a void out here on the end because it's, it's eventually, gravity is such a force over so many years, it's going to pull it down. So you take that same siding that you ripped and you create contradicting shims on top of that slope sill. These are contradicting shims that now create a flat area for the window to be installed on. Not only does it create a flat area for the windows to be installed on, it creates drainage ports between them. Okay? And it also looks like we used up our half inch. <laughs> That's right. You have to take that into consideration. You have to take that into consideration. And that's why this stuff is about planning. You don't order the windows and then figure out how you're going to prepare your rough openings. You you measure those rough openings, figure out how you're going to prepare them, and then order your windows accordingly. Because you're right, we took up 5 eighths of an inch right here out of our rough opening. You have all that synthetic material, and now you're putting wood, wood uh, well, shoots in there, and now that's thank, pieces for the water to. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a great comment. When we're talking about wood shims, wherever we're talking about wood, we're talking about cedar, okay? Mahogany if you like, but cedar's a lot cheaper. So we're talking about uh, a naturally um, oily type of wood that, that lasts a long time where it may come into contact with moisture. But typically, where you can, you want to use a composite shim. You want to use something that isn't wood and isn't susceptible to moisture. You just don't have this particular product that makes a good slope sill. The cedar siding does the best for that, and we're completely covering that anyway with the wrap. And because we want to contra contradict that slope exactly, if we use the same material with the same angle, it makes a good way to do it, and it's cedar, and we're not worried about that. But for the rest of the shims on the window, I would use a composite shim. I would use a non-cedar type of shim. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not the end of the world, it's just a suggestion. The window then sets on those shims uh, well you would um, probably use a little bit of silicone or something to put them in put them in place so that they don't move around while you're setting the window in there um, a lot of folks they can set the window in and and then kind of reshift those shims where they want because uh, they're, they're going to stay in place but a little silicone underneath them or something that, that keeps them in pretty good shape now we're going to put the window in place but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to caulk behind where the nail fins go. 
and we're going to use our special blue caulking to do that. We want to caulk behind here. I'm going to switch slides because we're probably, uh, we've done the contradicting shims, as you see there. We're talking about felt again, how to apply felt as a, as a weatherboard fashion, one over the top of the other. That's a type of installation bracket or masonry clip. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Where we have a wood product in a window, before you put this wood window product in, we suggest that you caulk this joint right here, down the back side of it, okay? A lot of folks are worried about all of the water that's going to get in this way. Well, this is a, this is a seam. This is an area where you can get wind-driven rain in here too. Not tomorrow, but 15 or 20 years from now or 30 years from now when something might swell or warp or pull away slightly. You can get some wind and rain in there. You've got a window. It's sitting on the floor. It's open. It's available. Go ahead and caulk that with a good caulk right down the back side of that. That's what we're showing there. Go ahead and caulk some of this stuff. You've got the window open. You can also use a flashing tape behind there if you'd like. Something to try and, something to try and give yourself some resistance for 30 years from now when when you might get some wind-driven rain into this area. If you don't paint, how many, you know, how many homes have you seen that maybe haven't had a coat of paint for 20 years? And this is now starting to create an opening in here. It's not sealed up anymore. So that's one thing we're showing there on the slide. But before you put any window in, be it this wood window or be it this clad window with a nail fin, we want a caulk. I'm going to get over here so you folks can see it. We want to caulk down the sides, like so. We want to caulk across the top, and we want to caulk down the side. Do we want to caulk across the bottom? This is a weep point. This is where we want the water to move. If we're caulking across the bottom, we've just shut our weep point down. And we're going to lock the water into the sill pan. It'll evaporate away, but it's not good for things. It's best just to go ahead and let it flow. And that's why we don't caulk the bottom. <clears throat> So we set our window into place here. And um, if you can, buy all your windows this size, because they're great to work with. <laughs> Take my word for it, they're wonderful to work with. I've got some little kind of clamps I put on the inside of there so that uh, stays in place. <clears throat> Well, if you, if you can, reconstruct all your walls to be this size, too, and you'll be in good shape. Now, a window installation is typically always a two-man deal, a two-person deal. Um, one, one person outside, one person inside. So now we've put our windows into place. Uh, we've we've uh, set it into the caulking. My lines are a little far out. I should have been a little closer in. <clears throat> Now we're pushed into the caulking. You need to level things. Make sure that the sill is level across. Make sure the sides are plumb. Put a couple of, uh, I, uh, I thought we had some nails over here. Anyway, you want a two inch um, uh, roofing nail, flat headed galvanized two inch roofing nail. And that's what you want to use here. So you button up a couple of, 
a couple of top nails, okay? Then you can shift the window back and forth till you get it plumb, level, and square. And the easiest way to square a window is to measure it corner by corner until you have exactly the same measurement. Then you know that it is square. So nail it into place like so. Show us nailing it. Use shims on the inside. Uh, all windows need shims, no matter how structurally strong they feel, like they're, they're not racking, they're, they're not moving at all. They still need shims to keep them where, where, they, where they are in that rough opening and, and keep them from moving. So we're asking you to use shims in there. Okay. Measure the diagonals. Shim them. Most windows want to be shimmed four to six inches from every corner and within 15 inches of each shim along the lineals. Okay? So you're going to have two shims here at the corners and, and no more than 15 inches in between along the lineals sides and the top. Shims have already been placed in the bottom when we did the, uh, when we did the um, sill pan. And you've got some of these notes here. So there we're showing the cross measure. That's a door unit there. Door units, um, depending upon your floor system and depending upon how straight it is, you want to not shim under doors unless you absolutely have to. And if you absolutely have to shim under a door, um, there's a process for it that I'd be glad to to describe to you if, if you should need it. But basically, it's layering solid material rather than sliding shims under a door. All of that weight, all of that pressure on that door sill, um, th they'll wave if, if you're just doing shims every foot or so. If you have a sagged corner or a humped middle where you've got to build the two ends up or a low middle where you've got to build the, the window up, it would be something more like layering a material like this. Actually, we use a material which is an ice shield. I mean, that's what we suggest. And you, because you can layer it now in eighth inches, and the first one can be um, the first one can be long. The next one can be a couple feet shorter. The next one a few feet shorter, and you get a nice, smooth, solid straightening of that floor. That's what we recommend when we're talking about not perfect sills. And when you're talking about doors, sliding doors, any kind of doors, those sills have to be straight and level. OK. This is on most windows that you will see. This is a drip cap. A drip cap is basically on top of the window to keep dirt and runoff from running down the window frames and the glass. Okay? It's meant to keep that dirt and runoff coming out here and then dripping past the window. Kind of keeps your window a little bit cleaner. It's a little bit for water management as well, but this is not a head flashing. And the word drip cap sometimes gets confused as being the same thing as a head flashing. And that's not the case. It is a drip cap. It indicates you want the moisture or the water to drip and drip out past the window, not getting all that dirt and stuff on your window. I'm going to pass that around. You'll see that on most windows that you buy. It's not the final product that goes on the top of this window. The final product that goes on this window, as you see, is a, is a head flashing. And a head flashing is always metal. It can be aluminum. It can be galvanized. But it's typically always going to be metal. We don't want, we don't want a flexible flashing used there. We want metal. Okay? And when you apply this drip cap, 
on this particular system that you see here, we want to caulk the back side or the upside of the flashing, and we want to caulk the bottom of it that's going to come in contact with the top of the window. Wind-driven rain can get under the drip cap and begin to, it's pressure-driven water is what it is. It can get under the drip cap and begin to drive its way up into areas. So we want to go ahead and caulk that either, either here or here. It does the same thing. And we want to caulk the back of it. And we want to apply it to the top of that window. It's a head flashing, not a drip cap. It looks like a drip cap. It kind of does the same thing. But this is a water management tool right here. Leave that on there. The next step is to flash the sides of the window. And you want to flash the sides of the window with flashing tape. Flashing tape is not the same thing as that flexible wrap that we uh, talked about before. Flashing tape is a usually a narrower, smoother type of product. The flashing tape would go all the way down each side. Go ahead and apply it here. Goes all the way down each side and it seals from the house wrap across the nail fin and up onto the window frame slightly okay now that typically would go all the way down i just i only have certain certain amounts of it here so i get it free from the house wrap people but they don't give me like huge rolls of it. So, again we're creating, creating even more of a barrier. The nail fin, by the way, is not a water management. That's an installation part. It's what holds the window to the wall. And the fact that it's vinyl and yeah, the vinyl is impervious to water, but a nail fin is not meant to do what the flashing tape does. The flashing tape keeps all of the water away from that rough opening uh, to the outside of it. It's, 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 a, it's, it's the finished type of seal. When we're done with that, another piece of tape then goes across the top and laps over those sides. You notice all of this is happening before the wrap goes back down. Because everything needs to be done in a shipboard fashion, or shiplap fashion I should say, so that the moisture keeps running over the top of, uh, everything is over the top of the, of the uh, system that's below it. By the way, that, um, that head flashing, that would have been fastened into place. I didn't do enough cuts here. with uh, some sort of fasteners, nails, but only on the back side, only on that back uh, vertical part. The head flashing tape goes on top of the side tape and all the way out to the outside edge of it, like you see here.
The wrap now comes back over the top. Get this right here. There we go. The wrap comes back over the top. And because it's a seam, it gets taped off again. This um, area now where the where the house wrap meets that head flashing that seam gets taped off again completely. Now this is a weak point again. Anything coming down this house wrap moisture now meets your head flashing and it weeps out. Okay? So what does that mean? What does that mean when our finished material goes over the head of that window? Like the sill, if you cock this up, you've just locked all that water in over the head of this window. A it's a weep point, allow it to weep. Okay? That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean uh, this it still goes right down on top of there, but allow it to weep. And driven, driven water won't go up under that siding. No issue. Well, it's going, it's going to be back there anyway either from the top or whatever might get driven up, but it'll come right back out again. If you lock it up, then you're right. No water will drive up in here, but all this will be locked once it comes down. And I've seen it before. And when it gets locked there, when it gets locked because it's been cocked over the head flashing, comes in on the inside. You see it dripping down from the top of the window down onto your windowsill. You hear it at night when you're trying to sleep. You're wondering, well, how the heck is that going on? Well, a lot of times when a house gets sided or something, the, the folks will, I mean, it looks great. They have this side across there, so it looks real good, looks finished, but it's designed to weep water there. This is designed to weep water under here. I'll give you one more trick, though. The last trick, I guess, is what we should do. If you're on a... If you're uh, exposed to a lake, a waterfront, if you're on a hill and you get a lot of wind, for instance, um, there's what's called a high pressure skirt. And what a high pressure skirt is, you know we've left this bottom as a weep area, but it is also a area where wind could, particularly like let's say you've got masonry or vinyl siding or something that allows a lot of air movement behind it. Wind can come up your um, wrap, go up under this fin, because it's not sealed, it's a weak point, and start driving into the bottom of this rough opening. At this point, if you feel like you want what's called a high pressure skirt, right at this point you take more house wrap, and I'm going to I'm going to use uh, this, and I want you to imagine that it is this house wrap. You would cut it about a foot to a foot and a half, and you would just lay it right under that window like that, and you would tape it to the nail fin. So if you laid it here, you would tape it to the nail fin right there. And now think of that. What do we have? We still have an area where if water wants to weep out, it still weeps out down here. But now if we have, you know, you remember you've got siding on here. If you've got wind driving, 
it, it sort of creates a stopper, especially if you get it down here a foot and a half, two feet deep. Now you've got siding holding it, and they call that a high pressure skirt. Uh, where it's used, where it was begun to be used quite often was when folks were, had uh, 40 acres of lake and a lot of wind and rain coming from the lake. So that's called a high pressure skirt. So is the drip cap over the head flashing? <coughs> the drip cap usually comes on the window. It's part of the window. Yes. I sent that, that loose piece around, but typically it's, it's typically the head nail fin. You saw there was a nail fin attached to that. That would be all one piece on top of the window when you install it. And then you would put the metal flashing over the top of that. I believe that's, that's the, we're, we're, we're running late, and that's kind of the meat of everything. One thing I want to talk to you about quickly is low expansion polyurethane foam. One of the most important parts of doing a window installation. It's just very critical. Because we've created a void in that rough opening, We've got a place for airflow, moisture flow, all those sorts of things. What we want you to do is create an impervious gasket where the nail fin is back there. And the way you do that is with impervious foam like this. Low expansion, though, because the low expansion foam won't um, distort the window. It won't expand to the point and begin to push the sides of the window in or push the top of the window down. It, it just doesn't have that kind of uh, uh, pressure buildup to it. It'll start to pour out the inside before it'll start to collapse any part of the window. You still need to be careful with it. You still need to apply it. Um, you kind of, kind of a knack to getting it applied correctly. Um, and you don't want to do it all at once. What we suggest is you go back to the nail fin in this void and just go ahead and go around the window. Remember, these would not be here. This would be fairly open. You'll have shims in there, but you'd want to go up to a shim, cross over a shim, go up, cross over the shims, go around. And basically, that's going to expand and create an impervious gasket to the outside, to the outside of the rough opening, but on the inside face of the, uh, of the nail fins. And I say, don't try and fill it all at once. Just make one round. You know, you've got all your windows installed. Just make one round around all your windows. 20 minutes, a half hour later, if you want to do some more, do a little bit more. If you try and fill the whole thing at once, you're going to have foam everywhere. It's, and it is, it's, it's bad stuff. <laughs> if the foam gets away from you, run away. Leave it alone. <laughs> I'm serious. You start messing around with it when it's wet and you've got issues. It's better to let it cure and then just start cutting it away and... So I've, I've adequately, you know, made you afraid of foam, but you need to have that stuff to, to kind of finish off this whole water management thing. Um, so if you're interviewing contractors, you want to be talking about what exactly does he do for water management around the house and around the window installations. And now you've got something to go on. Um, you can go to... Uh, our website or many other manufacturers' websites and get installation instructions, PDF form. You can download them, print them out, all those things. And, I, and I, if you've got a project going on, I highly recommend, and I know you're those type of people because you're sitting in here right now for that reason, investigating, reading, understand exactly what has to go on, and then begin to shop for your contractors or if you're going to do it yourself, Obviously, you know, you, you've 
you've gathered all your information, have a pretty good idea of what you're going to do. Yes, sir? How about a fiberglass insulation instead of the foam? Mm -hmm. Could you put the fiberglass insulation on there? You can. We still recommend that you do that initial round of uh, low expansion foam to, against the back of that nail fin. That is a, that's a gasket. And fiberglass insulation doesn't give you that water impervious gasket, but the foam does. So you can do like one inch of foam on the very outside around there, let that cure, and then you can tuck in fiberglass the rest of the way if you want. But that really, that gasket is, is very important, particularly, particularly if some of you folks are thinking about doing a window installation and not removing all that siding and all that sort of stuff, you definitely want that gasket out there. Okay. Sir? How far up does the window go before you get all the deep temper plants? Uh, it has to be over 18 inches from the floor. Yes. The glazing, the glass surface. So you can have, you can have the wood and you can have the sash and all that, but where that glass starts, over 18, inch, 18 inches from the floor or above, and the entire glass that you're talking about needs to be over nine square feet. If it, this window could sit on the floor and it wouldn't have to be tempered because it's only two and a half square feet. Nine square feet of window. Nine square feet of glazing. Okay. Any other questions about windows, doors, installation? Yes, sir. What do you think about these people that don't replace the whole window? They just replace your crank out portion or whatever. What do you think of those? Well, that's called an insert style. Glass, is that all they're doing? Well, that's called an insert style window, right? Where they go inside of the existing window opening. Is that what you're talking about? It's called an insert style window. It has its place. It's a good installation provided that the existing windows have been adequately inspected. Uh, by, you know, by a contractor who's going to do the work and it's determined that they're solid and in good shape. That might be the best way to do a window installation if you're not going to do all of the siding work as well, provided those frames are in good shape. Okay? If you've got punky frames and all that, they're going to have to get torn out anyway and then, and then you might as well go back to this. But if you're double hung windows, for instance, all of that wood's good, you knock on it, you can do an insert installation just fine. And now you don't have to worry about the water management in that rough opening because that was already created when they built the house and you're not disturbing that at that point. We, we, we make those windows as well um, and, and they, they're used a lot. But we want people to make sure the opening's in good shape. Yes, ma'am? Is there anything different about slider windows? Any, any what? Slider windows, they're different. Different how? Different than everything else. Well, the broader the sill, a slider window is a little bit like a patio door. The broader and longer the sill, the more, the more important it is that it has to be perfectly level, flat, straight. You start to bow that slider down or hump that slider up. Now your sashes are like this or your sashes are like that. And you're, I'm telling you, one eighth of an inch over a four foot glider is like three eighths of an inch at the top. Okay. That, if you have that, that indicates a bellied sill or a bowed sill. And that's almost always what a problem with a glider would be. It's not a product problem, it's an installation problem. Okay? Gliders are good windows, particularly now we've got some gliders that perform the same as casements. You had a question? Do you, do you give this class to contractors? We do. So you can ask if you're you could. We give this class up at our factory in War Road to contractors, and we give it out here in the field to contractors as well. And then does the city, when the house is going up, does the city expect to see that it's been done? The city, uh, most cities require not, you know, um, Cities at least require photographs of the wrap. I don't know that they necessarily require. If you're building new or reciting a house, the house wrap has to be inspected before they can sign it. Windows, window replacements do not require permits if you're not changing the size of the rough opening. So those are not inspected. Okay. 
Um, I know that when I was a contractor, I was a window and door specialty contractor for 20 years here in Minneapolis before I went to work with Marvin. Uh, and um, back then, most communities were asking for photographs of the wrapped house. Apparently now it's... They, they yeah. inspect them here. Okay, okay. And I think, sir, you had another question. I have a question if you resize your house. Yeah. Are you supposed to take the windows out and put all that in there? I'll tell you what. If you're gonna re if you're gonna do windows or you're gonna do siding or you're thinking about doing both, if there's any way you can do it, do it all at once, because the best installation you're going to get is to completely strip the house, completely wrap the house, and do all of this with the window installation, and you're gonna have a good tight water managed home if you do it all at once. And if you do well, that's just the best way to do it. Particularly if you know, okay, I'm going to do my siding now, and then two years from now I'm going to do your windows. Get the loan. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have noise, a noise problem on the north side of our house, street noise. Yeah. If I go to a triple clean, will that substantially cut the noise problem? So I double clean now. Yeah. You know what works best for, uh, that's, uh, we call it an STC rating. And what gives us the sound control, Sound transmission control is what STC stands for. What gives us the best STC rating is actually a dual pane window with two different thicknesses of glass. For instance, one would be an eighth and one might be three sixteenths. So the, the sound reverberates and it begins to fight each other inside of the airspace. Okay? Whereas if you have two eighth inch pieces of glass, it's it just it just it reverberates the same and it just kind of moves right on through. So you want it to fight each other inside the glass. Laminated glass is the best sound control type of glass, but it's very expensive. Tripane, um, do not go to tripane for sound control because two pane done the right way performs better than tripane. Uh, the larger the airspace, the better. So we want to keep the airspace as large as possible. Tripane reduces airspace. Yeah. If you have my card and you want to talk about sound control, I'd be glad to help you with that. Yes, sir. How do you feel about anything that's gas filled between the windows? Well, if, well, you want that. If you're getting high performance windows, which is low E and argon, you want the argon. As a matter of fact, many manufacturers, including us, don't give you that choice. For noise retention? A little bit for noise, but it's what, what the argon does for you is it, it it keeps the uh, convection currents down in between the airspace from transferring heat and cold because argon is heavier than atmospheric air. So you don't get the currents between the airspace. And that's what you want to, it, it, helps, it helps the insulation value of the window. And I don't think we even give you a choice. If you're gonna get a low E window, you're gonna get argon because you know, for 17 cents, it uh, will last you for 20 years and perform very well for you. It's very, very inexpensive. So we have, like, what I imagine, a 1956 slider windows. Okay, up, double hungs, up and down. Right. So we have heard where there's companies that are coming in and uh, refurbishing your slides, your mechanisms on the slide to uh, make it to slide up and down because mm -hmm. that's what it is. I mean, we when we try to open a window, I mean, it's, it's, it's just strong yeah. to get it up and down. Yeah. And that's just some rebuilding of that side slider. Yeah. You ever heard of that? Well, right now you probably have the aluminum side sliders. They they push in to retract, and everything's kind of corroded, and they're tough to operate. Right. Are you talking about keeping your same sash though? It's keeping the same window sash and glass and doing just the new tracks? That's so weird. <laughs> I'll tell you that if you're going to have anything done with windows, you will get so much better energy efficiency out of dual pane, low E, argon replacement windows. Now they can be insert replacement windows if your windows are in good shape, but when we're talking about the investment that you might put into those tracks and people to put them in, that's the only return you'll get on it is that they'll work smoother. You'll still be losing energy at a pretty good clip. You do a good low E and argon window, um, not, not even necessarily tri-pane, just a dual pane, 
good low E argon, you're going to save your air conditioning, you're going to save your heat. You get a little bit of sound, sound performance out of them too. Do anything with windows, do, do get high performance glass. Um, it, it just, you get, you get return on your investment with dual pane low E glass so quickly. I have a question. Like, what if, like, I have a window where it's, I probably should have called when I first got them, but it's like the brown, is it the glazing around it? It kind of gets bumpy and out. What is that? I mean, can oh. it be fixed? You're talking about glaze. You're talking about yeah, the, the glazing putty. Yeah. It holds the glass in, and it kind of chips out in little one-inch lengths in that. Yeah, kind of got a bump in there. Well, so you have a single glazed window and a one piece of glass in there, right? I don't know what. It's typically typically that's going to be a wood window. Yeah. And it's going to have one piece of glass in it, and that's going to be putty glazed from the outside into place. Um, the, they can certainly be reputted any painting company that paints, paints homes usually has several guys that can remove and replace and re-putty windows. Okay. Might want to check and see how, how structurally in good shape those windows are. Okay. Uh, because I just have them. Oh, yeah, they can be reglazed. Some of them you can take the sash. Some hardware stores, you know, major ones, the hardware Hanks and the Coast to Coast and that, some of them you can take the sash in and they'll do it at the hardware store, but you've got to leave it there a few days. You can argue about spraying around with the opening and around the window with the uh, oh. plates. Oh. Yeah. You do it on the bottom, you can the, 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 the dead stop the weeping process in it. Yeah, you don't do it on the bottom because that's where, that's where everything goes out of it. You do it on the three yeah. sides. Now, now, inside of the window, right, this is the window. But inside of the window, where you might have some extenders or something, you insulate there so you don't get wind flow through here. You just don't want to go all the way out to that nailing fin and foam that up or anything. So you're foaming the tops and two sides, but you're not foaming that bottom. Otherwise, we're locking that water into place. But that's a good reason to use the what we call that high-pressure skirt on there as well. But you can use fiberglass under there, and I would recommend you use fiberglass under there. A couple last questions, and then we're going to oh. do the drawing, huh? Yes, sir. Egress windows? Absolutely. Egress just means there are a certain size that allows folks to get through them in case of a fire. We have egress windows. Any last one? Yes, sir. Uh, just one quick one. If I wear a, a window with a uh, brick hole monitoring, does that the Can I download this? You can download installation instructions. It's not so different um, with the exception of there's no nail fin. You nail right through that brick mold tight to the house. That's how that works. I'll stick around if anyone has other questions um, and be glad to answer them for you.